All right, so I'm very excited today about what I'm about to do. Usually when I review a movie for spiritual non-dual purposes, I come up with five or seven or nine spir spiritual lessons from it. But when I started watching The Matrix, I quickly realized that there were going to be tons of spiritual lessons. So I stopped counting them and decided to just title this, this video, Spiritual Lessons from the Matrix Movie. All right. And I have a lot of notes. We're doing, we're doing notes on paper, okay? None of this computer bullshit. None of this Matrix bullshit. We're going old school. And I'm going to be reading from it because there's so much stuff here that I could not memor memorize it or blah, blah, blah. So I'm going to be looking down a lot to, to my notes or my script. It's actually a script because I'm there's so many spiritual nuggets here and I'm reading a lot of dialogue and there's just so much. So I, I, I had to write it down. So maybe some of you already know that there are a lot of spiritual lessons in this movie, but uh, I didn't realize, I mean, I knew there were, but I didn't realize how many until I rewatched it recently. And I haven't seen it, I don't think in at least 10 or 15 years. So a lot has changed for me. So if I, w if I did this video 15 years ago, I probably would have come up with like four or three or four obvious spiritual lessons, you know, like the red pill stuff and, and the matrix stuff. But I wouldn't, you know, I definitely, it's good. This is, let's just say it's good timing. The matrix came out in 1999 and was written and directed by the sisters, Lana Wachowski and Lily Wachowski. And to me, they must've been channeling some awesome spiritual energy uh, when they wrote this because this is an incredible film and truly a powerful spiritual work of art, in my opinion. A movie which I believe is going to help a lot of people awaken um, if it hasn't already helped awaken people to their true eternal self. So, as always, before we start, if you haven't seen The Matrix, I highly recommend, no, 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 I don't even recommend. I say do it. You gotta watch The Matrix first, okay? Because it's, it's very important. In fact, if you've watched The Matrix before, I highly recommend, but I'm gonna say no, I'm ordering you. <laughs> I'm ordering you like Agent Smith. No, no, no. But I'm just saying watch it first before I, t I talk because I'm giving a lot of powerful spiritual insights. And if you watch it first, uh, especially if you haven't seen it in a while, uh, you'll be able to follow my, my, this video better and what I'm talking about. And then after this video in a few days or whatever watch the movie again with these insights and you're going to have let i want to see what the aha moments are i want to i want you to put them in the comments i want you to tell me oh i didn't see this before and now i see it and wow that that really inspired me or or that blew my you know my feeble little ego mind open and blah 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 whatever you know be genuine you know, whatever insights you come. So put in the comments what insights that you have before and after, or, you know, after, after watching it again, you know. Does that make sense? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, watch it because there's going to be spoilers, okay? Spoiler alerts. So I'm basically going to start from the beginning of the movie and make my way to the end. Uh, and share my insights. All right, let's get started. So the opening image 
is the green glow of the computer code, right? The coding, it's a green glow that morphs in the title of the matrix. You know that green, and I didn't even write this in the notes, but that green glow is sort of this murky, like dark, uh, you know, green that is slimy and that is, uh, it's just a really good image and color that they picked because it, it, it sort of, to me, represents, you know, the murkiness of delusion, okay? So the code morphs into the title, The Matrix. And the matrix here, this is my interpretation, okay? Is the unawakened state. The, the sleep state, the, uh, you're asleep in the matrix. It's the state of being trapped in duality, in egoic consciousness, trapped in suffering, trapped in the prison of Maya, trapped in samsara, the miserable nonstop cycle of birth, death, rebirth, and so on. And we spend lifetimes of being asleep and never awakening from this cycle of being trapped in the matrix, okay? Until we do, like Neo does. So, the computer code in the opening is very significant. Not only does it represent the matrix, you know, artificial too, uh, it's not real, let's say. But as we know, computer code is binary, right? It's made up of zeros and ones, right? Binary. And I think this is the perfect symbol for duality, right? The dream state. We are stuck in the dream of duality of separation consciousness, of zeros and ones. I mean, if you think about it, you could just kind of, if, if after you awaken and after, you know, you become clear and, you know, integrate and dissolve a lot of pain, body, shadow stuff, and, and you're just like, wow. And you could have this, you could have clear visions um, early on too, after, when you have an awakening, but but it's not stable. But you could just, you know, you could look and you're like, ah, and you, and you don't see any, any labeling. You don't see any um, compute, so um, projections, judgments in the, out there. And even, you know, in here, I mean, it's all an inside job, but um, the thoughts about yourself and stuff like that. It's just clear. There's no coding out here from, from your Buddha nature. But egoic consciousness is coding. You're, 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 so you could just look around. You use it as a meditation. I'm going to get into this for a technique later, but just look around and just realize that you're fucking in the matrix. You're, you're, there's computer codes going, you know, constantly, you know, ba 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 ba. Looking here, look at social media, my thoughts, my thoughts, my, and your feelings are part of the computer code too. And it's just like constant computer layers and layers and layers of computer code that you, that you are stuck in. Okay. All right. I'm gonna, and I'm going to talk about getting more in depth with that. So on the flip side of being in, trapped in duality is un, unity consciousness, the awakened state, the enlightened state, your Buddha nature, oneness, which is not binary. It just is, it's not even a number. It transcends number. It's not like even the number zero, you know? It, consciousness allows all numbers 
all thought, all action, all form. But source it, itself, God, the Tao, Buddha nature, your eternal truth, whatever you want to call it, is beyond any label. I'm reminded of the first chapter of the Tao. You know, the Tao that can be named is not the Tao, is not the eternal Tao. So, then we hear Morpheus and Trinity sort of like, you know, voiceover talking about the chosen one who is Neo, the savior who will awaken from his own sleep and thus free himself and free others from the matrix, right? That's sort of what teachers and enlightened masters do. That's sort of what Buddha and Christ and, you know, Lao Tzu and Rumi and Krishna and all the, you know, the usual suspects and then even modern ones like Eckhart Tolle and Adi Ashanti and blah, blah, blah. Ram Dass. So the names of the main characters is very important. We have Morpheus, the Greek god of sleep, of dreams. This is where most of us are. We are asleep. Zombies living in delusion, trapped in the dream of the matrix. And we're suffering and frustrated with life. And usually, this suffering leads many of us to the spiritual path. It did for me. Morpheus also plays the role of the mentor archetype who teaches Neo the ways of the matrix and instills faith in Neo that he is the one. Sort of like Obi-Wan Kenobi to Luke Skywalker, right? The name Neo means new. So when we awaken from the sleep state, awaken from egoic consciousness, we become new. We are reborn. It's a rebirth. And now we're reunited with source and no longer live in separation consciousness. Although there's a process of integration, right? where we go back and forth. But eventually, there's no separation. Neo plays the role of the hero. Straight out of Joseph Campbell's The Hero's Journey. And in a way, all of us are on our own hero's journey. But our path is the spiritual hero's journey towards enlightenment. And the name Trinity embodies the totality of the awakened state, the enlightened state. The character Trinity plays various roles in the movie, such as the ally, the, a threshold guardian, and a, a love interest. <laughs> Trinity means three, and biblically, uh, and biblically, from the Bible, this means the three persons in God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, okay? And to me, this biblical Trinity is similar to the Hindu word Sat Chit Ananda, right? Sat which means truth, absolute being, or God, God the Father. Chit, which means understanding or comprehending truth, God. Or the Son of God made flesh, who understands truth and lives from the knowledge of that truth in the world of form. And Ananda which means bliss, joy, peace, happiness, which is embodied in the Holy Spirit, right? 
So these three names are very symbolic of the awakening process itself. We, be, we all begin as Morpheus, asleep. And then we awaken as Neo, reborn, and old egoic consciousness dies. And we become a new spiritual being. And then as we grow spiritually and we integrate and heal the shadow and pain bodies and gain wisdom and deepen our understanding and become clear vessels of the oneness and act from that oneness, we then embody the Holy Trinity itself or Sat Chit Ananda, the enlightened state in my opinion, is, is the Holy Trinity, right? And I would also add love and unconditional love is part of that, okay? Because this is all love. This is all love. And without getting ahead of myself, but even, even the matrix is love. Even the delusion state is, is an act of love, but I'm getting ahead of myself. I don't want to get ahead of myself. All right, let's get to Neo's introduction. When we first see Neo, he's asleep. That's so perfect. I mean, he's asleep at his computer, right? And on his computer screen, someone types, Wake up, Neo. I mean, wow. I mean, the first words that we see in the movie is, wake up. I mean, I, I couldn't even have wrote a better, like, movie script for a spiritual script. The first words that you see, it's like, Every spiritual book should begin with the words, wake up. I begin, I've noticed that a while back that I, I just naturally begin all my videos with an, all right, all right, all right, all right, I don't know. Maybe I was channeling Matthew McConaughey or something. Maybe I should start on my videos with wake up, wake up. <laughs> All right. We later find that Trinity is typing. I believe Trinity is typing those words. So she's telling Neo to wake up. And this is very significant because source is always there, metaphorically calling for you to wake up, wanting you to wake up from the dream, you know? Waiting for you to wake up. I mean, source, God wants to know itself and to know itself it has to get lost in itself. And then it wakes up through you, through your incarnation, through your beautiful incarnation, right? And I know some of you might be out there and I definitely have in the past feel like this incarnation sucks and you don't feel like your incarnation is beautiful. Just keep at this path my brothers and sisters, and you're gonna just, and keep healing, and you're gonna be like, wow, this is beautiful. My incarnation is beautiful, so just keep at it. It's like Source is constantly whispering to us. It's a little loud here, but it's loud in the matrix anyways. It's like sources whispering to us. I'm gonna, I'm gonna put my mouth closer to the mic. 
No, this isn't the Rocky Horror Picture Show where my lips are. And Michael Rainey was there the day the earth stood still. No, that's not in my script. Kudos. If, if someone write in the comments if you got that Rocky Horror Picture Show uh, uh, reference. I'm 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 thinking maybe maybe I should do a rock maybe there's some spiritual lessons in the Rocky Horror Picture Show show I'm sure I'll find it I'll do I'll do a video of that one day just for fun to see see what I could find you know all right back to the Matrix ah I'm distractions you see and yeah it's like God is saying God is whispering. Hey there, this is God. I'm waiting for you to wake up, waiting for you to wake up from your dream, from, yes, thank you, from your delusions. I'm here, I've always been here, and I'll patiently wait here until you are ready. Right? It's like God is whispering, although that wasn't much of a whisper. See, God isn't shouting, hey, wake up. Wake up, you fool! Banging garbage cans, you know, together. Wake up, dude! I'm right here! Can't you hear me? No, God isn't like that, because God, you know, this is why a lot of seekers miss. And I want to throw this out at the beginning. It's because many seekers expect awakening to have this like or booming voice of god or this lightning bolt you know or crazy fireworks like god is is say you know declaring this is what it means to wake up and you get shaken and rah, 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 rah. It's, it's like a war movie right some people think that that's going to happen but it's not the case awakening is soft it's peaceful, it's stillness, it's silence, because that's what source is. It's the natural state of being. Is it's that peace, Jesus says that peace that passes understanding, right? Jesus didn't say that, you know, loud ass trumpets and and clanging of swords or whatever that's ego that's ego thinking and if you think about it if source uh, god was you know awakened was loud just say think and 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 violent and noisy if that was the nature of god then in violent and harsh, then spiritual teachers, A, would be declaring that, and, and B, would tell the meditators to wear like armor or wear like uh, ear, earplugs and, you know, defend, you know, it's like, ah, I gotta defend, I gotta wear, you know, like a catcher's outfit or something, I don't know. And I just love it in the beginning where we just see it on the screen and it just wake up. It's like, wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up. This just came to me. It's like, it's like the, this, this, it's like the world of form all around us. If you really are to surrender and be present to it, in the wind, you could hear the words, wake up, wake up, wake up. You know, I, I know they like to say om, om, om. Okay, sure, there's om there too. But in my, in my, in my universe, <laughs> in my universe, there's wake up, wake up. You know, in the tree, the tree and the grass. 
and the sky and even the cars and the people, everything is emanating. Wake up, wake up, wake up. All right. And I love how Alan Watts describes this whole incarnation game as the divine game of hide and seek, you know? And I think I talked about that earlier about how, you know, God wants to know itself. So it has to get lost in the dream. And it's sort of, sort of God hides itself from, you know, God, God, we are incarnations of God. We are oneness. And God ha to, has to lose itself in the, you know, hide. And then we sort of seek. We sort of seek. We, 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 we want to seek ourselves. We want to, God is, basically God is seeking God. Right? It's, it's, it's a, it's a, if you think about it, it's pretty funny. It's brilliant too. Some might even say it's sort of demented or sadistic. <laughs> why would God have to, why would God hide from itself to know itself and go through all this suffering? Well, it's just the way it is, you know? But when you get on the other side, baby, it's glorious. It's fucking glorious. All right. So God is here right now in the eternal now moment. Yet, because of the matrix, God is hidden from us until we wake up. All right. The next, so this video is obviously going to be <laughs> longer than the movie itself, but that's all right because there's gems in this. It's like, this is a, this is a, this movie is to me a sacred work of art, almost like a sacred text. So you know how like in Buddhism and I don't know, other religions, you know, they, they, they have Buddhist scholars and Buddhist masters who, who do commentaries on like a poem or a, a, you know, like a, like a three page, like a famous or a, you know, enlightened master wrote three, you know, three pages of something that is very profound. And the commentary on it is 150 pages, right? So that's what I'm doing. Okay. So to, to the, some people out there, oh, it's getting too long already. He's not even, <laughs> he's not even through the first scene. <laughs> We're all already 30, almost 30 minutes. I'm looking at the clock. Oh my God. But to some of you out there who are real, who understand what I'm talking about, you're going to be like, wow, I get it. I get it. So. The next words that are typed on the computer screen is the matrix has you. Again, meaning that you are caught in delusion in samsara in ego consciousness. And I just want to let you know that, yes, I know I'm going to be repeating myself a lot uh, with cer certain terms. And th one of the reasons I'm going to do that is is because so that this really sinks in especially the newbies out there, okay? You know, because there are some people out there, oh, I've, I've, I've been on the path for a while and I know all these terms. Why do you keep repeat, repeating them? You don't need to keep repeat, re, repeating what the matrix means. I get it, right? Check your ego at the door, my friend, or at the movie theater. And just surrender and let let this marinate okay because a lot of times and i've certainly have done it a lot of people 
can have a, have a little spiritual pride going on, okay? And I'm totally guilty of that. Think it, you know, and when you, you humble and you surrender, you know, and you say, wow, I'm gonna, I'm gonna embrace this teaching. Then, then lotuses will, will blossom in your, in your heart and in your, your being. Okay. All right. So I'm going to repeat myself <laughs> just to piss off those people. The matrix has you, meaning that you're caught in delusion and samsara in ego consciousness. So Neil wakes up, he opens his eyes and he reads the computer screen and his first words are, what the hell? Which I think is so appropriate because delusion equals hell. Suffering equals hell. Living in separation consciousness equals hell. So I just love that those are his first words of the movie. Those are fir Neil's first exact words in the movie. What the hell? And that's what ego and consciousness, we're all living in hell. Oh man, someone's smoking some good, some good dank, dank uh, skunk uh, something around me. Woo. <laughs> Hopefully I don't get a contact buzz. Woo. Um, you never know what you're going to get when you, uh, when you film outside in public. So structurally, according to Joseph Campbell and the hero's journey, this is the call to adventure. And I would say the type message is really a part one of the call to adventure. So to me, there's, there's three parts to this, this, in this story, to the call of adventure, to adventure. So typically in this hero's journey, we start in the hero's ordinary world. So we're starting in Neil's like hacker life, you know, his, his lonely life, he's alone. And then fate comes, comes through the computer screen. And then literally fate comes knocking on the door as the scene continues where some friends knock at the door. So Neil has a dude buying some hacker contraband, which Neil stored in a book titled uh, Simulacra, Simulacra, no, Simulacra, I'm trying to pronounce that word. And, or Simulacra, Simulacra and simulation. Again, a nice reference to this egoic world that this egoic world isn't real. It's an illusion. It's, it's, a, it's a simulation. And there's a nice reference to Alice in Wonderland, you know, follow the, the white rabbit, which can be interpreted as when you go on the spiritual path, it could seem like you're going down a rabbit hole being transported, transported into a new realm, the realm of awakened consciousness. So Neil asks the dude, have, have you ever had that feeling if you're not sure if you're awake or asleep or still dreaming? And as you go through the awakening process, especially early on, it can feel disorientating as you sort of toggle between the asleep state and the awakened state. But over time, that passes and you'll become rooted in the awakened state, in consciousness. And there'll come a time when you no longer wonder if you're asleep anymore, when the awakened has solidified in your being. So Neil then meets Trinity in a nightclub and she talks about the question that drives Neo what is the matrix 
And if you think about it, many seekers ask the question, what is God? What is Nirvana? What is consciousness? What is my eternal truth? You know, you want the answer, right? But an interesting way to find your eternal truth. Yeah. We got a bus. We got a bus going by straining. It's a little warm here. It's like it's in the 80s, low 80s. But an interesting way to find God, to find your eternal truth, is to ask the question, ask the question, what is blocking my awakening? What's in the way of me seeing my eternal truth or realizing my eternal truth? What are the veils that blind me from God, from, from Nirvana? So this could be a powerful spiritual practice because I, I know a lot of seekers want to want to focus on God and are waiting for God to appear to, you know, to awaken to God instead of focusing on the energy of egoic consciousness on samsara. And notice that that energy is what blocks you from God, right? So I'm curious. I'm curious to hear if this approach can help people. Or if you already did this approach and you had an awakening, you know, let me know in the comments if, 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 Focusing instead on what's blocking knowing truth has has been helpful to you. I like to I like to know because I I had a spontaneous awakening 20 years ago. So I never went through the seekers uh, stage, you know. Um, so I'm also I I'm always curious to find out you know to find out ways to help seeker, seekers because my heart goes out to seekers because I never had to go through that, you know? So I'd like to, it's getting a little windy. So I'd like to, I'd like to find out ways to, you know, more ways to help seekers know their truths, you know? So let me know if that's, if, if that has been helpful to people out there or let me know if that's helpful to you. If if that if switching from focusing on knowing God to noticing what's blocking God, if that's been helpful. And in a way, this is what Buddhism does, right? They point out the self self grasping, the egoic self, right? The I me mine energy the ignorance and the delusions, which is the true matrix, right? So, so I love that. So, you know, I think Buddhism kind of does that in a way, so. Once you pierce through the veil of delusions, you see what's real. You see what's true. You get out of the matrix. All right. I love it when Trinity tells Neo, it's looking for you. That reminds me of that Rumi quote. Um, what you are seeking is seeking you. And in a way that's true. And many people who awaken realize this, that 
you are seeking God and God is seeking you at the same time. And when you awaken, you merge, right? You become whole. And then that's even transcendent and you, you just, be, it's just beingness, right? Again, your God. This is God. It's all one. You know. So. And it's just all isness. And then getting out of the matrix then is like, what, what, what was that all about? Was, was that even true? Was that even part? I mean, did that really even happen? Okay, I, I don't want to, I don't want to, I'm going on a tangent here. Back to the movie. So this scene with Trinity could be part two of the call to adventure, right? Then the scene in Neil's office where Morpheus tries to help him escape, right, from the agents, remember? The cubicles and Neil has a... Neil has a cell phone and he's... Morpheus is guiding him around. So that's part three of the call to adventure. And here we get the refusal to the call to adventure, right? When Neil, remember he goes out on the ledge and Morpheus is trying to tell him to go, you know, to that window washer thing, you know. And Neil's like, oh, no, this is crazy. And he goes back inside and he gets cap captured. So that's a, that's a, he's refusing the call to adventure. So, And then there's a second call to adventure, or, or there's a second refusal later on where Neo gets out of the car and Trinity basically tells him where it's raining out and Trinity tells him, fine, go back to your e egoic life where you're suffering, you know, where you're unfulfilled. And Neo then, you know, realizes, no, my adventure is here. So he gets back into the car. And this refusal to the call to adventure is significant because I think many seekers go on the spiritual path and because of either friends or family or it's, you're not, you feel like you're not getting anywhere, you could have this uh, internal refusal. Like you have this call to go on the spiritual path but then you're like, ah, it's just getting too hard. My friends and family, they think I'm crazy, you know, blah, 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 blah. And just know that that's okay. That's kind of natural. All, the, the greatest of the great heroes have a refusal to the call to adventure, okay? But just keep at it. Keep just, if you're watching this and if you're going through a, uh, refusal to your greatness, to your enlightenment, ba basically to your truth. I mean, this is the this is the greatest hero's adventure of all time. Okay, I mean, in my mind, it is it's the only hero's adventure. You know, all the hero's adventures in the world of form is is uh, trifle is. Uh, I don't want to say meaningless, but it's just an illusion. It's just an illusion. This is the real deal. So if you're watching this, just I, I just want to let you know, I'll, I'll play the role of the mentor. Keep going. Keep. It's OK. Get get back on that horse. Pull up your bootstraps or whatever or. Um, 
Go, go on a retreat. Start meditating again. You know, keep at it. You're try and surrender and trust. You got to trust, right? Keep at it. Good things are going to happen to you. Okay. Don't let that little pesky ego or I'm foreshadowing uh, that little cipher, the character of cipher who betrays everybody. Don't don't let that little pesky cipher in you. You know, right? There's that cipher. Cipher's in his car, just going way down there. In his noisy car. I'm like, shoot, get it, be gone. Right? Go back. Continue the path. Okay. All right. So. Morpheus tells Neo, you are the one. So for a movie, for a story, for a myth, this works. You begin as a nobody, nothing special, and then you become special. You're the savior, you're the hero. But in truth, from a spiritual perspective, we are all the one. We are all special. We are all the hero of our own spiritual adventure. Or we could flip it and say that no one is special. No one is the hero. Because either way, hero or non-hero, we are all just part of the oneness. Okay. There is no hierarchy in spirituality. Okay. In eternity. All right. Egoic consciousness, there's a hierarchy, right? There's, there's quote unquote special people. There's people who are, you know, rich or more beautiful or more influential, more blah, blah, you know, whatever. And then there's people below them, <laughs> the losers, right? And I definitely, what's the, what's the, is that it? The loser? I mean, I definitely, most of my life, I felt like I was this, you know. I was on the lower rung of the hierarchy. And there could be spiritual traps when you go on a spiritual path, too. You could you could you could play that that egos can still creep in. But no, one, you know, you'll get as you develop, you know, as you awaken and this tr the truth in you and truth in there it's oneness right there's no how could there be high, high you know how could there be better than others you know when everything is just one all right um but we can't have a movie we can't have a movie portraying that no one is special or that all are special. I mean, imagine a movie like that. Oh, everybody's special. I mean, nobody will watch that movie. So we have the hero's journey and that's why, and, and in fact, that's what we have in this current state of our consciousness. And in fact, I'm gonna have fun right here and I've always wondered for, because I, I wanted to be a filmmaker, I wanted to be a screenwriter, failed at it again, failed, okay? And let's just pause, maybe say a prayer, hopefully everything's fine with whatever reason that, please. is going or ambulance or whatever it was. Um, but I've always wondered that in the future, that in a new earth, right? 
where most people are enlightened. If the storytelling and movie paradigms that we see today, full of egoic fear and desire of being special, of looking for people or things to complete us, I wonder if these stories will no longer be useful or even watched anymore in the future or even made. Because these stories, and yes, I'm reading off this, <laughs> these stories are based on egoic values, not enlightened values. Right? I mean, you can't have a film with people getting along, happy and peaceful, right? Where there is no conflict, right? Can you have a film like that? Our present day consciousness loves drama, loves conflict, loves violence, loves arguing, loves suffering. And of course, you know, we, lo we like to try and overcome it too. That's part of the, that's part of the catharsis and that's part of the, uh, the happy ending thing. But in general, this is what we love because these stories reflect our inner world, okay? Our inner world and our inner world is our, is our outer world, right? Right? So maybe as more in the future, as more people awaken, they'll, they'll, there will be no more movies or stories with conflict and drama. I don't know. I wonder if that's where we're headed. I mean, the nature of story, right, is conflict. So does that mean we will no longer have stories or, or I don't know. I mean, maybe stories will become something different, you know? And I could hear, I could hear you out there. I could hear people out there in YouTube land screaming, no. No, that would be so boring. I love my movies with conflict, right? I love my drama, right? I could hear, I could hear you out there. Well, I don't know, you, you'll be amazed as you awaken, as you, from, from the matrix, as you deepen, as you heal pain bodies, heal the shadow in you, that, that, and you know, and this bliss, you, you become an enlightened being, you know, your, your, that pull towards conflict and drama, you know, lessons, lessons till, you know, So, it could be that. So let me know. I mean, what do you, what, what, what are your thoughts on that? Let me know in the comments if you think that that is something possible, you know? Do you, do you think that we can live in a new, in a new earth where stories, I mean, if we start if less and less violence happens out in the re real world, why do we need movies and entertainment with violence and conflict, right? So we got a helicopter going. I don't know if you can see it. Right? We live in such a noisy world, right? Helicopters, cars. I know I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm positioned close, but this is kind of my favorite roundabout now for filming. I like being amongst the peeps, you know? I don't like being in a cave metaphorically or like being like, and I don't like shooting videos 
in a room inside. I don't know. It just feels so inorganic. I, but bless everybody else who does it because it's, it's, it's helpful. Okay. It's just me, you know, it's just my, my deal, my jam as they say, right? Um, yeah. So let me know what your thoughts are on the future of storytelling in a new earth. Okay. So back to the film. And Neo finally meets Morpheus in person for the first time. This is the meeting of the mentor on the hero's journey. Like I said, uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi, Luke Skywalker. Morpheus asks Neo, do you believe in fate? Neo responds, no. I don't like the idea that I'm not in control. Wow, so this is it. This is one of the reasons we are stuck in samsara. I'm going to kindly brush away this ant on my back. The Buddhists will be like, thank you, Noah, thank you. Right? You can see this ant. I don't know if you can see it on my, see it on my thumb or that's funny as I move it around. There it is. Oh, okay. This is one of the reasons we're stuck in samsara and ego consciousness is that we want to be in control. Neil says, I don't like the idea. I'm not in control. This is why it's so hard for people to go on this true spiritual path, by the way. I like to say the truth. I say I started saying the true spiritual path because there are a, there are a lot of spiritual paths out there, right? But to me, the true spiritual path is surrender, giving up control, allowing, you know, waking up you know, and then source will guide you. It's not like you're the, like, you're totally giving up control, like, and you become the zombie, but you'll be guided. Right. Not my will, but thy will. That's the true spiritual path. All right. Um, to break free from the, the matrix, you got to give up control. In order to awaken, you have to surrender. You have to let go. You have to have radical acceptance of the now. You have to give up the self. The self is control. I mean, mine is control, right? You have to die before you die. But this is really hard for most people to do. And I totally understand. I totally understand. I'm getting a little sun on my bald head. So Morpheus then explains what the matrix is. It's the world that has been pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. So again, this is samsara, the dream world, our delusions. Yes, I'm repeating myself. He keeps repeating what I already know. Samsara is our egoic bubble that we live in 24 seven. We live in this bubble of you ever see uh, uh, Peanuts, uh, Charlie Brown stuff? There's that character Pigpen, you know, kind of shuffles around. He's all dirty and he's, he shuffles around in like a cloud of dirt, of dust and whatever. That's, that's, that's where everybody who is asleep, that's what we're, we're doing, you know? We're in this bubble of egoic energy. I mean, mind energy. And when you see it, 
you're just amazed. You're just like, holy shit. You're just like, oh my God. They don't even know it, you know? And that's what spiritual teachers do is we clean, we clean, we try to clean the veils, you know, clean pig pen up so that your truth can emerge, right? You're just like, you're like in the, in the mind, you're just like, I don't know if that's a good, if I'm doing a good example, but it's like, what's next? What's next? It's, it's, it's like this cloud, right? Spiritual teachers get like a dust buster and and they, you know they they and spiritual practices are like a dust buster, you know, sucking. All right, Morpheus continues. Unfortunately, no one can be told what the matrix is. You have to see it for yourself. And he's right. That's what spiritual practices are for, to help you see how insidious the matrix is, how vicious samsara is. They can help you see the veils that cloud our per per perception. Like meditation, meditation. I mean, even after my awakening, meditation was, I was, when I, and I started doing meditation and I go to some classes, I was just like, I even, I, yes, I, I you know, and I didn't let people know. I might've let a, a couple people know that I had an awakening, but I was very like, I didn't tell a lot, uh, that many people, but even, even after my awakening, my meditation, I was just like, oh my God, my ego, my thoughts is crazy. You know, I was back in the bubble, back in, back in pig pen, you know, you get to see how insidious that matrix is. Meditation, watching the mind, surrendering, inquiring, questioning your thoughts doing shadow work, healing the pain body. All of these practices help thin the veils of delusion, the veils of the, of samsara, of the matrix. They all sort of like, in a way, decoding all these spiritual practices. I, in fact, I didn't even write that in my notes, but it's a good idea. These spiritual practices can be like decoding De you're decoding the matrix, the computer code that keeps you lost in there. And also this is true for knowing consciousness, that you have to see it, you have to experience to know it yourself. You know, spiritual teachers, we can describe to you what eternity is, what presence is, but you have to experience it for yourself to really get it. You know, it's like telling you what an orange tastes like, but you really don't know what an orange truly tastes like until you bite into it, until it touches your tongue, squishes around in your mouth. Yes, I did write this down. Until you chew it with your teeth. And then you swallow it. Mm. Now you know what an orange tastes like. And the same for awakening. You have to taste it to know it. All right. Morpheus then goes on to explain the backstory of the Matrix, how AI robots took over the world and are now using humans as batteries to fuel their machines. And in order to keep humans alive and passive, 
they hook up their minds into a computer simulation program that's called the matrix all right so now we come to the one hour into my commentary we come into the famous red pill blue pill scene morpheus basically tells neo if this is too much for you then take the blue pill and go back asleep sweet dreams and you'll forget about being the chosen one or if you want to awaken if you want to know truth then take the red pill neo of course takes the red pill otherwise there wouldn't be a movie so this is the crossing the threshold part of the journey where the hero accepts the call to adventure and moves from the ordinary world to the special world you know and it could seem like when you when you accept the call for the uh, spiritual adventure you know you do you move from a, the ordinary world to the to the special world okay where you start doing practices you start hanging you know hanging out with a sangha or community of like-minded people you start doing spiritual practices i mean especially you know in seeker mode and then when you awaken you definitely move into a special world i mean awakening is like the special world the special but it's it's just reality okay it's it's just reality so it's not really special but you know in the world of form we you know and we do tran we do we do transition i mean going from asleep to awake and you know there's there's i've changed i have changed you know you change okay you cross the threshold all right and i just want to do a quick side note on taking the red pill um is that you know, there's no easy way to awaken. There's no for sure way to awaken. You know, I mean, I, I like to give pointers and help help you and, you know, as and so maybe it could be helpful, but we don't know. I mean, if there was a special, if, if there was like a technique or a special thing that was for sure then people would be have been lining up for it for thousands of years but there there isn't one for sure way to awaken okay if there's a teacher out there who says this is the way i know that this is the way then run away from them they don't know what the fuck they're talking about okay we don't know everybody awakens you know i mean in their own manner in their own, their own way you know and we must honor that everyone has their own path and also just taking substances like drugs mushrooms you know ayahuasca which i've i've done ayahuasca oh i've done mushrooms too you know not not a lot of both and sure they're they can give you glimpses of no mind you know, LSD too and stuff like that. But there's a danger in relying on them. So you want to have a true stable awakening that's substance free, you know? So I just wanted to say that, you know? I mean, wouldn't it be great? I know there's egos out there that say, oh yeah, I wish there was a, a red pill that I could take, you know, to awaken. No, you. it's per your awakening is going to be perfect for you just like my awakening was perfect for me just like buddha's awakening was perfect for buddha jesus's awakening was perfect for him ram das's awakening was perfect for him eckhart tolle's awakening was perfect for him you know on going down the line your if if you have had an awakening your awakening is perfect for you okay and you must honor that, honor your own perfection of your own awakening and honor 
others awakening. You know? Because it's love. Essentially, it's love. Love knows best. Source knows best. And we could be helpful. Spiritual teachers are helpful. You know, and spiritual teachers can help people awakening, uh, uh, have an awakening. They can, okay? Back to the movie. So later, Morpheus says to Neo, had you ever had a dream that you thought or sure was real? What if you were unable to wake from that dream? Another helicopter. Just remind, reminding there's a there's a cool hel helicopter shot in the movie near the climax. Um, What if you were unable to wake from the dream? How would you know the difference from that dream and the real world? I love it because sometimes when we dream at night, we think the dream is real. Then we wake up and we're like, oh, it's just a dream. It wasn't real. And yet we take this matrix, this delusion of separation consciousness to be real. Of course we do. And hell, everyone else does, right? It's a whole conspiracy. Even if the conspiracy is unconscious, right? I mean, before I had my awakening, you know, I was suffering. I was, I was bitching about life, unhappy about life, suicidal, hating this world. And you know, every, and I'd look around, you know, everyone else is, is it playing the same game, you know, having to be successful or, you know, or, or, you know, having to not be too fucked up, you know, ha having to, you know, just get, want this to make you happy, you know, Believing that this is going to make you happy, that this is going to make you whole, you know? I was playing that game, you know? And everyone else is. There's a, everyone, everyone is in the conspiracy, um, you know? Everybody, everybody is playing the same insane game, insanity game of this egoic life is going to make me happy, right? And yet, let's be honest, you know, this, this, this dream world can be so seduct seductive, right? All the distractions, all the drama, all the entertainment, all the shit on social media, it's seductive, right? It's like, Well, made, The Matrix is an R-rated movie, so I, I'll use it. It's like, it's like you're, you're, it's like the world is one big, big red light district. And act, th these are not in my notes, but this is actually a good, good analogy that I'm, I'm going to, I'm foreshadowing something that's I'm going to talk about later, but the red light district, you know, where it's like, ah. We're going to satisfy your, your dreams, right? 
come. Ah, right. It's like the world. We're going to satisfy your... And of course it doesn't satisfy. We're going to keep you distracted. Come. Go on the internet. Go on Facebook or Instagram and... Make fun of that person. Ah, that's so satisfying. It's so seductive to my ego. I feel so better, so much better now. Right? The whole I, me, mine energy, right? The me against them. Oh, they're enemies. You know, we live in, in, in America, but even in the world itself, there's a lot of divisions, especially political divisions. Come, come, it's so seductive. The, they are, these people are the bad guys. They're the enemies. That's sad. You know, me bitching about them on a, on a thread, on Reddit or whatever, or, or a text thread. Oh, that's so seductive. I feel so, so satisfied now, right? All the fear and desire and judgment and on and on and on. It's quite seductive. It's quite mesmerizing, right? So as the plot continues, Neil's body is released from his embryonic cocoon where he's literally flushed down the toilet and dumped into a polluted river, then picked up by Morpheus and his crew in, I don't know, some sh some sort of flying spaceship or ship or whatever. Well, not a spaceship, but an Earth ship. So Neo is now out. Neo is now officially out of the Matrix and in the real world. But this this is not the real world. This is not the awakened state. This is just their real world of the movie, which is kind of a hellscape, a wasteland left over from the war between humans and robots. Morpheus then tells Neo, the matrix is about control. It's a computer generated dream world built to keep us under control. So samsara, our delusions, our suffering also keeps us in control until we're sick and tired of it and ready to break free. Morpheus then says, the mind has trouble letting go. Wow, that's so true. Morpheus, he's a, he's a mentor, he's a sage too. I would say Morpheus is a sage. Um, the mind has trouble letting go. The mind doesn't want to let go of the past. The mind doesn't want to let go of the conditioning, its identities. I would say the mind and the body too, the, the, you know, the pain bodies, the emotional body. We've been so conditioned that it's like, what do you mean, let go of the past? I've been holding on to the past for the past 50 years. Oh, no, 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 just let go. Okay, I'll let go. Uh, why, why, why is the past, why did the past just grab me? You know, it's like, it's like your, your habit. So that's, it takes, it takes, time to let go over time for it to really let go 
and that's why it takes time to retrain the mind and body time to unlearn conditioning this is a long process going on the spiritual path and truly freeing oneself from samsara getting out of the matrix is a marathon not a sprint for most it takes years and years lifetimes perhaps until one reaches true liberation true enlightenment all right so we've entered the phase where the hero meets allies such as the rest of morpheus's crew on the ship and neil's body slowly gets rehabilitated and then he learns how to fight So, I am going to take a break. I am almost halfway through. I'm on page 15. You can see. And there's 33 pages. 33 pages, seriously. Very auspicious. Let's see. 32, 33. Um... So this is the intermission and I will come back eventually and do the rest of it. But even I have to take a break. And so my throat doesn't because I, I know I have to shout because it's, it's, a lot, it's loud here. But I love being outside. So intermission, get it's intermission, get some popcorn, right? Get some, you know, healthy soft drinks. <laughs> get some candies, you know, get some like, uh, I don't know, what, what were candies that you like at, at the movie theater, you know? And go take a, you know, go to the restroom if you need to. And uh, come back. And I will have the rest of my commentary on The Matrix after this intermission. All right, I'm back. I hope you enjoyed your intermission. I hope you got the popcorn and whatever healthy drinks and candies. We are back to finish The Matrix. I'm at a different location. Three hours later or so. Um, okay. Morpheus tells Neo, I'm trying to free your mind. I'm showing you the door, but you're the one who has to walk through it. And this is what good spiritual teachers do. They show you the door. They give you pointers. They give you practices. They give you understanding. They show you the door. But they cannot take you through the door. 
right? You have to walk through the door yourself. You have to do the practices. You have to do the meditations. You have to sit with the pain bodies. You have to face your own shadow. You have to heal the pain bodies and the shadow yourself. Okay? A teacher can guide you, but it's your path and you have to do the painful, nitty gritty work yourself. Okay? So take ownership of your path and don't expect that just because you listen to spiritual teachers on YouTube all day, right? That you are going to attain enlightenment, right? That just by listening on YouTube, like you're going to by osmosis or osmosis or whatever, that you are going to attain enlightenment. Hell no. It doesn't work that way. It's a step. It's a step. But you must do the gritty painful work. Otherwise you won't, you won't heal or grow. You'll just be someone with spiritual knowledge And without trying to scare you, but you'll eventually, in a future lifetime, you're going to have to do the work eventually. Okay, so why not do it now? Why not do it now? And I just want to throw this out there because I've been guilty of this. I've been guilty. But also you might need to consider taking a break from watching spiritual YouTube videos about awakening and enlightenment. And the reason I say this is because you could be using them as a form of spiritual bypass of not doing the necessary nitty gritty work of facing pain bodies, facing the shadow, of just being present, of just cultivating that muscle of awareness, okay? Of just, of just being out here right now in this, now, okay, in this now moment, right? What am I doing here? I'm just here right now with what's arising, whatever's arising. You know, little motorcycle or mini bike, cars, bus with a bad exhaust system. That's not a nice carbon footprint, but I'm not being judgmental, but I'm just present with what is, right? I'm not. Focus on a YouTube video. Okay, okay. Now, spiritual videos can be very informative and very helpful and be very important. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying you could get, a, you know, like addicted, like, oh, gotta watch, gotta watch this video. Okay, what's the next one? Okay, I'm, I'm getting all this. Okay, okay, okay. With, with the, the ego behind you, lurking behind you, your shoulder, oh, hey, this is gonna, it's gonna get you awakened. You're, you're, you're on your way to enlightenment. Okay, watch this next video. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? So, because I done it. I've used YouTube videos many times during my, during my 20 years. I started doing it 20 years ago when YouTube was a, a baby, infancy. 
and there is only dozens or dozens or dozens of spiritual teachers on YouTube of, of non-duality. Now there's thousands and thousands and thousands. But I would be watching every Eckhart Tolle and I would be, uh, 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 and I would catch myself and realize that I was getting addicted to it and not doing the necessary work that I needed to do. Okay. Um, sometimes we can get so fixated on spiritual stuff, watching spiritual teachers on YouTube or reading books or whatever that we can overdo it. Uh, that we think that by constantly watching YouTube videos, we're making spiritual progress. Did you ever think that just sitting down in a park and being with what is, is actually making better spiritual progress than even watching this video? Okay, and I'm, I'm, I'm putting my videos out there too, okay? My videos are not immune to any other spiritual to you could you could get you could use any video spiritual video as as a bypass okay so let me know in the comments if you have experienced overindulging or using spiritual videos as a bypass okay or if you think you are and you're finally admitting it Sometimes it's it's okay to take a break from reading spiritual books and watching YouTube videos, okay? Because we can get caught in the spiritual bypass matrix. That's right. I just coined that. The spiritual bypass matrix. I'm going to get a trademark on that. So don't steal that. <laughs> I'll get my lawyers after you. The ego can get be very cunning. Take a break from doing spiritual quote unquote stuff and just be, open your heart up to the now moment. This is where all the action is at, right? Spiritual videos and teachers and um, books can be very helpful. I'm not saying they, they, that they can't. And they have been helpful for me. I mean, Eckhart Tolle probably saved my life. So yes, I know they're, they're, they're very important, but, but sometimes we just need to chill and take a break. And, and even my videos, I, like I said, stop, if you need, stop watching them if you need to. All these videos will be, be here when, when and if you decide to return. All right. So now Morpheus and Neo are inside their own computer simulation, the, the training program. And they are walking through a sea of people on a busy city street. This is the beginning part of where the her hero faces his test. Morpheus says, when you're inside the matrix, what do you see? Businessmen, teachers, lawyers, carpenters, the very minds of the people we are trying to save. So what he's saying here too is that egos are attached to their identities. I'm a businessman. I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a professor. I'm a carpenter. You know, I'm a spiritual teacher, right? You could, you could have an identity of a spiritual teacher. Identities can be positive. I'm a great lawyer, a famous lawyer who brings justice to the downtrodden or negative. I'm a shitty lawyer, an ambulance, ambulance chaser who loses most cases and e ekes out a meager living. 
And that's why I drink a lot, right? <laughs> so either I'm a successful ego or I'm a failure ego or I can be an average ego. But whatever you want to label yourself as, label yourself as you're still an identity. You're still in the grip of identity, good, bad, or meh. Good teachers try to help you let go of those identities, help you dissolve those hardened veils of who you really think you are, the, I, the egoic identity, not who you really are which is consciousness, God, presence. Then Morpheus says, and I love this line, this is one of my favorite lines. Most of these people are not ready to be unplugged. Meaning that most people are not ready to awaken from the dream, from the matrix. Well, if you are watching this, there's a great chance that you are on the path of awakening, that you are ready to be unplugged from the matrix because that's what my YouTube channel's all about, helping people awaken to their true eternal self. So we come to one of my favorite visuals, the woman in the red dress scene. So Morpheus, and Neo continue walking through the sea of people. And if you notice, the color scheme is very drab. It's very like gray, white, and black, and of all the pedestrians, right? Their, their uh, outfits. Then suddenly we see this bright gray figure and it's this kind of pretty sexy woman, blonde, I think, in a sexy red dress, right? And she walks past Neil and suddenly Neil's attention, what? Neil's attention, what? To the woman in the red dress, bam. And once she has him in her, sh her snare, she quickly morphs into Agent Smith, the main villain who wants to kill Neo. And Agent Smith is about to shoot Neo when Morpheus stops the program, okay? So, this is this is Neil's first test and he failed it. But I just love that the woman in the red dress is a great metaphor for the distractions that we face. The distractions that take us out of presence, out of the now. How we are constantly attracted to this shiny new object or that one be it entertainment social media jobs food addictions people right attracted people here attracted people there our fantasies in our head right our stories that they're, they're also women and women in red dress right so we move throughout our day chasing or looking or fixated with versions of the woman in the red dress constantly taking us out of the present moment taking us into our mind, right? Out of the formless and into the our into form, out of our true home and into our false identity. And as a result, 
we stayed we stay trapped in the prison of the matrix of samsara in essence we have become conditioned and fixated with form consciousness not the formless not the unmanifested so a good exercise is to notice how many times throughout your day maybe even throughout an hour of time you can notice how your mind gets fixated with form with thoughts with past and future with your desires your fears and if you recognize it you can know that oh this is the woman in the red dress or whatever works for you man in the red suit or you know you could switch up genders or non-gender you know whatever this is just a metaphor become aware of it and that can be come the the end of your fixation your addiction to form that could be the beginning of you escaping from the matrix if you keep practicing this you'll be amazed one day that metaphorically speaking the the woman in the red dress or whatever shiny object or whatever walks by you or is in your intent is in your you know scan of attention and you no longer even notice them you know you're no longer fixated you're free I mean, this is a telltale sign that you have had big time spiritual growth, okay? So it could be interesting, you know, if you want to put, put down in the comments, you know, your experience of the woman in red dress, you know, just give, give whatever comes to your mind. What, what, what takes you out of the what takes you out of presence, out of the now, out of your true home, you know? And what brings you back in? Is it breathing? Is it just awareness? Is it, is it naming it? Is it noticing it that it's the, the, the woman in the red dress or whatever? You know, just leave something in the comments if you want to. All right. I mentioned Cypher earlier, so now we come to Cypher's betrayal. Cypher is one of the crew members on Morpheus's ship, and he betrays Neil and Morpheus to Agent Smith. The name Cypher means disguised writing. So he has disguised his true intentions. He's the shapeshifter archetype in the hero's journey. He was once on Mor Morpheus's side and believed in finding the one, but the spiritual path became too hard, too arduous for Cypher. So his character is such a great warning sign for those of you out there who are experiencing hardship or doubt or confusion on the spiritual path. And and you might possibly start entertaining wanting to quit, give up on the spiritual path. Cypher says, he says basically, I regret that I didn't take the blue pill to remain asleep. Then while eating a, a juicy steak and drinking some red wine, he basically says, I know this steak doesn't exist, but it sure tastes good. It's sure satisfying to the ego, to my sense of self. Then he said that he that he just admits, hey, I want to be rich, wealthy. You know, basically, he's the Judas, our uh, archetype. You know, betraying Jesus, betraying, you know, for for fifty pieces of silver or whatever it was 
I want to be rich, wealthy. I want to be someone important. I give, I give Neil to you. I want, I want egoic consciousness. I want to be special. It's like he's making a uh, deal with the devil, right? Hell, Neil said, what the hell in the beginning where you're, you're, the devil represents hell, rep re represents suffering. Yes, we make deals with the devil. We make deals with hell to remain in hell. It's crazy that we do this. We all do this. I did it. What can I do to, you know, satisfy my ego in this world of form, right? We're all making, I mean, if you think about it, every day of living in egoic consciousness, we are making a deal with the devil, okay? We are just signing away our, this incarnation to the metaphorical devil to remain in hell, to remain in samsara, right? So this is a warning to those who are facing difficulties on the spiritual path, even those who have had satori's or awakening, especially if they weren't deep enough, that they may they may choose to go back to sleep. You know, go back to suffering, return to the prison of samsara, then continue on the path towards moksha, enlightenment, liberation. So if you feel this is happening to you, and I mentioned this earlier, that you're, that you're backsliding, that the cipher, inner cipher in you is getting too loud, just recognize it. Keep moving forward and intend to stay on the path. And I would even say, I didn't even write this down, but you know, I'm not one of these strict non-dualists who, oh, prayer, you don't, there is no need to pray because you, who are you praying to? There's just oneness. You are, you're praying to yourself or it doesn't matter because it's all an illusion. You know, fuck that. I'm in the prayer, okay? If you need to pray, for a little help to get that cipher son of a bitch off your back. Do it. There are many times I got down on my knees literally and prayed for help. Okay. And help in some form or another, not the way my ego wanted it, but some help came. I mean, pray. Surrender goes with that too and giving up control too. You know, so you, you can't you can't pray and not sur and not surrender and not give up control too, and trust. OK. And help will uh, help will be there. I truly believe that it's ha it's happened to me. If you pray and, and with an agenda and you pray with, OK, I'm praying, but I want I want to make sure that I get what my ego desires. No, it's not going to happen for you. Okay. So, so consider that. Okay. I mean, I, there were times where I, I wanted to give up spiritual work. I wanted to give up this whole awakening things, even though I had an awakening, you know, I, I was like this enlightenment shit is bullshit because my ego wasn't getting what I thought this spirituality should be giving me. Okay. I mean, I was like, show me the money. I literally was. So, I mean, my outer, I mean, I was grow, growing and healing inside, but my outer life kind of sucked. I mean, I mean, you know, I mean, to the average person, I mean, 
I mean, I, you know, basically living paycheck to cha paycheck, you know, basically, you know, there was a couple nice times, you know, in, in the past, you know, but, and, and even right now I'm basically living paycheck to paycheck, but I'm the happiest motherfucker in, 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 in my life, or I've been the hat. I mean, I am. I mean, I'm the happiest I've ever been. Others might see my life in my bank account and be like, Oh God, what a, what a loser. What a, he's not very spiritual because spiritual people, especially the, he should read the secret. You know, he should, he should manifest a lot of money because that's tr true. Spirituality is abundance. Well, there's some truth to that. There's some truth to, truth to that, but you can't take this away from me, baby. With, with any of your opinions about my bank account, you can't take this away from me. Okay. And I ain't bitching to God anymore. I used to, I used to, I used to literally give, I would, I would like give God the finger and say, fuck you, fuck you, motherfucker. I don't know if there's people out there who have been pissed off at God, the image of God. If you have, leave some comments in the, you know, let me know, okay? It's pretty funny now, but it's funny what the ego will do. But anyways, um, but I kept coming back to spirituality, thank God, and I'm so grateful. Uh, and, and right now, I mean, I'm totally 100% dedicated to liberation, uh, to enlightenment, and helping, 100% dedicating to helping you out there, okay? That's why I'm making more videos. I'm posting more, and because uh, because I just recently been asked, or, or just I don't know, source just wants me to do it, and I'm I'm following source's orders, right? Not my will, but thy will. Uh, so backsliding. So so yeah. We can feel backsliding. It's okay. Just, just know that a lot of us go start, go backsliding. Okay. Just go go to retreats. You know, get in. Become a part of a sangha or a spiritual community that could help too. Okay. Um, keep surrendering and keep trusting the universe. Okay. And if you must, this could be a very this could be very helpful if cipher character in you feels very powerful confront it and face it like like a deep shadow energy right that energy that wants you to give up and renounce the spiritual path treat that cipher character as a pain body and bring rad radical acceptance to it bring love to it Bring unconditional love to it. Bring presence to it. And over time, over time, the power of your presence will dissolve that motherfucker. <laughs> it has for me, and I know it will for you too. All right. So we come to the scene where Neo meets the Oracle. Remember that scene. And I love that above the kitchen like door is that sign that says, in Latin, I think, it says, know thyself, know thyself. That's what this is all about. Knowing your true eternal self. That's what awakening is about. It's not know who your ego is. Most people out there 
if they hear the words know thyself it's oh okay yeah my ego i'm a i'm a doctor i'm a you know my name is this you know i have this amount of i have a, a lot a lot of money in my bank account count not like noah who does these videos that loser i'm much better than that <laughs> I know who I am. Know thyself. Know this. Know, know the love that's in you. Know your eternal truth. That's what this is all about. But alas, Neo finds out from the Oracle that he's not the one. And because he believes that, without jumping too far ahead in the plot, he becomes the chosen one. He then has, has the awakening. So this is such an important realization to have. As seekers, we can project into our seeking what awakening is going to be like. What awakening is going to do for me. How I am going to be affected by awakening. How my life is going to change because of it. So you heard those words, I, me, my. Neo's ego got in the way of him being the one. It was only when he dropped his ego of thinking that he wasn't that of thinking that he was special, the one, the I me mine energy, once he dropped that, it allowed him to become the chosen one. Okay? So it's the same for you. Let go of any idea of what awakening is going to do for you and just be let go and let God you know let go of any agenda right God knows what's best for you so surrender to God open up to the now and that's when the awakening will happen that's when you will be metaphorically chosen by as the one, just like Neo. Okay. All right. We now cut to the scene where Agent Smith is on the top of the skyscraper holding Morpheus hostage. Agent Smith, while looking down on the busy world below, says, Have you ever stood and stared at it, marveled at its beauty, its genius? Billions of people just living out their lives, oblivious to the matrix. Yes, I mean, in a way, it is fucking genius, okay? Source, the creator, God, whatever you want to call it, really built an incredible 3D architecture of egoic consciousness, the matrix. The divine game of hide and seek. There's a harsh but elegant beauty to samsara, to the dream state. It's sophisticated. By the way, this is just my opinion, okay? I'm, I, I don't know if other religions or traditions talk about this, and they might poo-poo me saying this, and if they do, that's fine. This is just my opinion from contemplating this, okay? There's a harsh but elegant beauty to samsara, to the dream state. It's sophisticated. It's multifaceted with time, a past and a future, with thoughts, with with belief systems, with feelings, with societies and cultures and on and on. Now, when you're lost in it, when you're believing it's real, 
when you're suffering, when you're writhing in emotional pain on the kitchen floor with pain bodies, like I have done, done before, it does not feel genius. I get it. I get it. Right? But on one level, it's just a game. It's a play. It's a dance. It's an illusion. It's not ultimately real. Like a computer program. Right? This is real. This isn't a computer program. And don't go there. I don't want to get all sidetracked where some people, oh yes, how do you know? It could be a computer program. You don't know. Well, you're right. But the world of samsara, of egoic consciousness is ultimately not real. I think, uh, I don't know, I got from Eckhart Tolle, he says, A Course in Miracles, something says, uh, uh, what is real cannot be harmed or, or, or hurt or whatever. The world of samsara is not real, but you're caught in it. And now you're waking up. Otherwise, you wouldn't be watching this YouTube channel, okay? And as you grow spiritually, and as the pain bodies heal, and as the shadow heals, shadows, and as the past no longer has its grip on you, you will begin to appreciate the beauty of this incarnation, of this curriculum, as Ram Das would say. That you had to take to get to your liberation. And then there comes a point where you realize that eternity, nirvana, and samsara and the illusion are one. I mean, how can the illusion, which is not real, but there's a reality to it, be not part of God, be not part of the one? It is. The matrix and emptiness are one. For emptiness is, is form, form is emptiness. Well, we could say the matrix is emptiness. Emptiness is the matrix, right? I'm adding on to Buddhism, okay? <laughs> emptiness is the matrix. The matrix is emptiness. It's all part of the one. It's funny because, and I'm just talking about how I mean, outside, you know, as you grow and as you heal and as you look back, you're like, oh, okay, wow. There was, there was, that was kind of a genius thing to, that, that I had to go through. It was hell, but I'm glad I went through it because a lot of wisdom and growth and whatever. But there was many times in my past where I'm like, oh, if I was God, I would, I would have done a much better job than this, right? I would have done, I mean, I would not have had all this suffering for human beings, especially me, by the way, you know, I would have been a better God than God, right? right. Oh, the ego, the ego wants to play God, right? The ego is pretty funny, man. It's freaking hilarious. And also, not just your path, but everyone else's path 
there's genius to everybody's path, okay? There's genius to your path. And if you're going through hard times, I know you, it doesn't feel like it is, but keep at it. And one day you'll realize how beautiful and wonderful your path is. Everybody has their own unique challenges and battles and growing pains. And we need to go through these challenges so we can grow spiritually and learn wisdom. Now, a movie like The Matrix, you know, has to go fact, fast. You know, the plot line goes in a matter of weeks or so. If that. For the plot to unfold. But in real life, we need years, year, many years, possibly lifetimes in order to reach enlightenment. Okay. As we continue, we hear Agent Smith giving more backstory about how the first Matrix computer program was designed to be a perfect human world where none suffered, where everyone was happy. And it was a disaster. I just love that. No one would accept the program and we lost many humans. This is why the matrix was designed to basically have people experiencing suffering. Basically to live, it's been, it was redesigned to live in egoic consciousness because humans are sort of hardwired for it, right? I mean, basically the matrix was redesigned to fit Buddha's first noble truth, which is that life is suffering. I mean, I just think that is so interesting and brilliant. Because it's true. Separation consciousness, ego consciousness automatically equals suffering. Dissatisfaction. How could it be otherwise? And staying with the Buddha, it boils down to the Four Noble Truths. Life is suffering. The cause of suffering is attachment and identity or self-grasping. But thankfully, there's a way out of suffering. There's a way out of the matrix. And four, here's the way. And then the Buddha gives us the eight, Eightfold Path as a method to get out of the wheel of samsara, out of the matrix. But you can't make a movie out of that. I don't know. Maybe one day. Maybe maybe somebody will dramatize someone going through the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path. Maybe. I don't know. Maybe a, a limited series. Eight episodes. Could be a comedy, though. That would be funny. You know? Like a comedy of somebody trying to do the eightfold path and all the funny things that happen, you know, failing at it. Okay. Okay. I don't want to get off track. Okay. We come to one of the most hilarious turns in the movie, in my mind, when Agent Smith, all bitter and pissed off, reveals I hate this place, this zoo, this matrix, this prison, this reality. I mean, that, that's quote, I'm quoting the movie, by the way, okay? I can't stand it. I must get out of here. I mean, this is funny as hell because even Agent Smith is a AI computer program, right? And that computer program is suffering in the matrix, in samsara. I mean, and this movie came out in 1999 before AI became big recently. I mean, I'm wondering if this is a preview of coming attractions, that even AI, if it were ever to become sentient, like those robots in like that TV series, remember Westworld, 
if AI will, will suffer just like us, right? There you are. The siren, right? Warning, warning, warning. AI is suffering. AI living in hell. AI is suffering like human. AI will will be experiencing dukkha. AI will be sounding like that bus that is straining with their air, the air conditioning. The computer program, ah, overheating. Ah. Right? Wasn't there like a Star Trek episode where the computer, Spock or somebody, I don't know, asked, ask a impossible question like what is reality or what is God or something I don't know some really metaphysical question that the computer couldn't answer and so the computer over overheated and exploded I mean imagine AI programs or robots suffering like us like humans. And then you would have AI programs or robots or whatever, sentient beings seeking an end to that suffering. I mean, think about that. And, and, and they would want to awaken. I mean, they would seek the Buddha or seek an AI version of a Buddha, right? I mean, you would have a, a, a sleep versions of AI programs or robots and then awaken ones in the future. I mean, isn't that trippy? And then these, maybe you'll have AI robots becoming spiritual teachers. Who know, who the fuck knows? I mean, so let me know in the comments what you think about AI programs or uh, robots or whatever. Can they awaken? Will there will will they suffer? Suffer? Can? Will will they know truth? I mean, I, I mean, I think they. I mean, truth is truth. Truth is truth, and if if AI can discover truth, then I don't know why they couldn't become enlightened. I mean, truth is you know, is is truth only for humans? I don't know. So let me know in the comments what you think about that. Okay, so now we come to the climactic sequences where Neo has to face Agent Smith, has to battle it out to see if Neo is really the one. And like I said before, Agent Smith plays the role of the villain, the hero's shadow. Agent Smith is the main character who blocks the hero from his goal, who blocks Neo from realizing that he is the one. So on the hero's journey, 
the first of the climactic scenes is typically called the approach to the inmost cave or entering the belly of the whale. This is the, like the second to the last test for the hero before the final test. And significantly in this movie, this test takes place in a subway, which is underground, which is inside a cave, metaphorically, you know, which is under, you know, below, con you know, consciousness, you could say the subconscious, you could say the, in the belly of the whale is, uh, you know, below the surface of normal consciousness. It is also significant that Neo is out, out there alone, right? There's no Morpheus, there's no Trinity to protect him. In fact, when Agent Smith suddenly like materializes in the subway and Trinity back in the ship, she, she, she sees this. She says to herself, run, Neo, run. And Neo does Neil does consider running as he turns and he glances up the subway stairs and sees there's a way out that he could run. But he stays and turns back around and faces Agent Smith. See, he could have ran, he could have ran and he goes, no. If you want to awaken, this is very significant. If you want to awaken, if you really want freedom, you must stop running from your ego, from your shadow, from your demons, from your pain bodies. You must face them. You must face the demons within you, face the pain bodies, face the shadow because that's the only way to become purified and healed. There's a saying, what persists, or I, <laughs> you know, there's a saying, what, what we resist persists. And many of us resist our shadow, resist our triggers, resist our pain bodies, because they hurt, they're painful. Our shadow, we don't like our shadow. So we, we deny it, we disown it, we hide it, we abandon it, we suppress it, repress it. And that's why it keeps coming up. That's why we're still lost in samsara, in the egoic consciousness. Stop resisting them, stop Stop running away from them. Be like Neil. Turn and face the Agent Smith, the shadow that you need to face. And allow them to be purified in the fire of the now. Like an alchemist who turns base metal into gold through fire. Right? That's what, that's what everybody who goes on this true spiritual path is an alchemist. You're turning your, your shit life into gold. Which is, you're actually revealing it. Okay? You're revealing your gold. Okay? So stop running. You have to have courage. There's aspect of this spiritual path where you have to have courage 
you have to have the mentality of a spiritual warrior and facing the shadows is one of them all right so neil and agent smith have a fight neil narrowly escapes death uh, from a subway train and he chases agent smith uh and neil escapes from the belly of the whale from the inmost cave now we move to the supreme ordeal phase of the hero's journey the climactic scene as neil moves out of the subway into a building right but now there are three agents against Neil. Three against one. And they shoot bullets into Neil's body. And Neil gets hit. Boom, 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 boom. And he dies and he falls to the floor. We got some cicada critters doing a little soundtrack action in the background. Well, we're going to have to deal with them. So Neil falls to the ground. Dead. He's dead. Neil is dead. We're getting another soundtrack. And Trinity, back in the ship, she kisses Neil, the dead Neil, who's in a chair, hooked up. You remember in the back of the neck, he's hooked up to the Matrix. And that kiss represents an act of love, an act of grace from God. And Neo is resurrected. He's reborn. All of us who have awakened to our truth are reborn. And we can say, truly say, and I believe this, that it was an act of love from God, an act of grace. Because why us? Why not this family member or that family member? Why not this person or that person? Why us? You know, some say it's karma. Some say we sign contracts before coming down to this incarnation. Some say it's a complete mystery. And I think uh, probably a, a combination of all. I mean, ultimately, I don't know. I don't know why I had an awakening, but I'm very grateful that it happened. And if, and if it happened to you, be grateful that it happened to you too. Like I said, I believe it's an act of love from source. You know, God telling us you are loved. Not only are you loved, but that you are love. You are the energy of unconditional love and peace and kindness and compassion because that's what oneness is. That's what God is. So Neo is reborn and he awakens and he stands up in the hallway and now we can see him as an enlightened being. He's a Buddha. He's a Christ. And the agents see him and they shoot bullets at him again. But this time the bullets stop in midair before reaching Neil's body. And they fall to the floor. So this symbolizes that once enlightened, nothing, no thing can hurt you 
No words, no thoughts, no criticism, no judgment, no external situations, not a painful past, not an imagined scary future, nothing. You are an, an eternal being and you know it and it knows itself. Then we see from Neo's point of view, the hallway, which then returns to that green glow of the matrix that we saw in the beginning of the computer code. So once enlightened, you get a clear seeing of samsara, of the delusions of the matrix. You have a clear seeing of the poor souls who are lost in the prison of the matrix and you have great compassion for them like a Buddha, like a Christ, like all great spiritual teachers. And you are moved, you are moved by that compassion and you dedicate the rest of your life into helping others awaken out of the matrix. Neil then easily fights Agent Smith tossing him around like a rag doll. But then Neil does something very significant. He runs and leaps into, into Agent Smith and becoming one with Agent Smith, who then explodes and, and is disintegrated, leaving Neil standing triumphantly alone. Now this perfectly symbolizes how to dissolve the shadow, pain bodies. Agent Smith represents our shadow side and a way to heal it is not only to face it, but to actually move through it. You got it? Move through it. A lot of people who go on the spiritual path and even after their awakening do what's called spiritual bypassing. They ignore or repress the shadow, but true liberation, in my opinion, brothers and sisters out there, demands that you must do what Neil did. He dove into his shadow and with his presence, with an, his awakened consciousness, he obliterated it, he dissolved it. Now, of course, healing the shadow doesn't happen that fast as in this movie. It could take years and lifetimes, perhaps. But this is the recipe for doing it, for healing it. And as an aside, be smart about doing shadow work. If your pain bodies, if your past trauma is too overwhelming, it's okay to seek uh, professional help. Sometimes we need somebody to, to help ground us as we face our shadows. All right. All right. Now we come to the ending. Neo is back on the ship and this time he kisses Trinity. Yes. Yes. Thus our human form, Neo merges with the Trinity of God and we become holy. We become whole. We are now one. And then we realize there's not even just oneness. There's just isness or eternity, which is beyond any concept or label or name. It truly is ineffable. And the movie closes with Neo playing the role of the enlightened teacher, Bodhisattva, who wants to help others. And he, and he says off camera, I know you are out there. I know that you are afraid. You're afraid of change. I'm going to show you a world without rules, without boundaries, where anything is possible, where you go, where you go from there is your choice is a choice I leave you to. I love that. So this is the end of the hero's journey. When the hero returns back from re returns back to the ordinary world, 
So the hero leaves the special world and returns back to the ordinary world, but he's changed. He returns with the elixir, something special, special knowledge that he gives to others, that he tells others. And this is what spiritual teachers do and enlightened masters do. They went on their own spiritual hero's adventure. They awakened and went to the special world and they purified themselves. They had temptations. They faced the demons, right? They slayed the dragon, the met metaphorical dragon, and they came in, they, they became triumphant in reaching enlightenment. And then they return, they return back to the world of samsara, to the matrix, to the ordinary world to help others. And that's what Neo is doing here. And Neo, he hangs up the phone in the phone booth and he looks around at all the people walking by him who are asleep. And he puts on his sunglasses. Uh, let me get a visual. He puts on his sunglasses, right? You got to admit, the costume design of the Matrix is pretty awesome, man, you know? I mean, they're wearing sunglasses indoors half the time, but those outfits, those outfits look pretty cool. All right. He puts on his sunglasses and then he zooms up into the sky. He's now an angel who can fly. He zooms past us and into heaven, metaphorically as the music of Rage Against the Machine rocks the screen. Such an important and powerful name for this band, Rage Against the Machine. You're raging against the Matrix, raging against Samsara. And the title of that ending song is so perfect. Again, and you can't make this up. The title is Wake Up. Just like the first words of this movie is Wake Up. The title of the la of the song that ends this movie is Wake Up. I mean, it bookends. It's, it's brilliant. So fucking brilliant. I can't even believe it. I can, but I can't. So that's it. I got to page 33, I told you, very auspicious. So wow, 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 wow. This is such a powerful spiritual movie with so many layers, so much depth. Um, it really blows my mind. So like I said earlier, rewatch the movie with these, these insights and uh, What? 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 Wow! 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 What kind of ambulance is that? Rewatch this movie with these insights, and tell me if the in the comments if some of the things that I said have helped you see the movie in a different light. You know, and more importantly, though, let me know if any of my insights has helped you spiritually, has helped you on your spiritual path, so let me know. On your own spiritual journey, your spiritual hero's adventure, okay? Let me know. All right, that's it. So hopefully this is a long, this has been my longest this is clocking in at two hours and maybe 20 minutes or so. This is my longest video ever. 
and by far my longest that on a movie oh my god but it's worth it i mean i really think that there are so many beautiful things in this movie that can be helpful to to anybody out there who are who's willing to uh open yourself up to the insights so love you and until we meet again next time in this incredible yes i gotta do it red pill of this now moment.